Hey, yo, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the road podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I am one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got DJ D Miles. What up, what up? We got Jamie the Great. Yeah. Uh, DJ Never is MIA, but we love you, fam. Uh, can't wait to have you back. We got two of my homies over here. We have two special guests today. My man, DJ Ross One, author of Rap Tees. Brooklyn's finest by way of Ohio. We got my other favorite person here, DJ Moma, Queens representative, co-founder of my favorite party in the universe. Everyday people, what's good, fellas? What's good, man? What up, what up, what up, what up? Yep. What's good, man? Ross, you in New York right now? Chilling. I'm in New York. So what's up? I heard, I heard a few days. you know, you told me on the low that you, you know, is it, is there a Rap Tees number two book coming out soon, or what? Was you over there in New York? No, shit? no. There is nothing. <laughs> there is nothing coming out soon. Shut at that all. down. Not, e- not even close. But uh, I've just been shooting. You know, like there's been downtime, so I've been kind of like going through tees I've got since the first book and reaching out to a lot of people and just started shooting shirts and sort of compiling and see if there's enough there to merit another book and it looks good but uh you know i'm just kind of working away on it same okay. way i did with the first one so and, you, uh, and, you, and maybe you know may, maybe there might be a, a volume two okay so you're starting to possibly work on the second book for rap TV. yeah yeah that's that's accurate okay you know set All right, the cool. expectations properly All but right. uh all right but yeah, it's cool. I've been, you know, just linking up with people this whole time in New York, just basically like nonstop meetings with collectors and industry people and going, you know, shooting tees, yeah, yeah, shooting yeah. the shit. I just saw you, Ross, in Vegas, too. You were doing Encore Beach Club and shit. You was doing that. Yeah, I was in Vegas last week. I'm going back to L.A. tomorrow and then Vegas again this week. So yeah. good to be back in a little I know, man. A little rotation. Everyone's going, everyone's going back to work. My favorite party. Everyday people is coming back. June nineteenth right. in New York. Yo, you got like a Spotify billboard in Times Square. How did you get that? Who'd you finesse? What'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> there was no finesse. Was- uh, actually, Spotify is rolled out a hub yeah. for like kind of black creatives and, and black artists from underground to mainstream. And it's called Frequency, right? And a, a few people I know was in charge of rolling out that hub and curating it. And they hit me up and they was like, yo, we want you to curate an element of this frequency hub, which is called a house party playlist. And it's just, you know, the name says it all. And they wanted it curated by everyday people. So that's what we did. It's like a a three to four hour playlist, kind of everything that we play at the party. And as part of their promotion, they got a billboard on 34th Street right by Penn Station. Crazy. And so, you know, it's it's dope. Like we're up there. It says house party curated by uh, everyday people. We got... um, a photo, you know, shot by a photographer featuring two of our hosts, Shernita and Gito. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like an amazing, like full circle type of moment. You know, we just started this party in, in 2012 in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, you know, the eight or nine years later, we're on a billboard on 34th Street. It's uh, it's a, like an out of body experience, you know, and I live like two blocks from there. So it's just like, even crazier, you know. But that's what brought me to uh, L.A. because after they rolled it out, they wanted to shoot some content with me and, and Sada, who's my partner at Everyday People. So, you know, they, they, I flew out here. Sada lives here in L.A. And they interviewed us. And, I, I, you know, they're putting together some content around Everyday People, around our story and the playlist. And that's, that's going to come out at some point. That's dope. that's dope. That's what brought me to L.A. three weeks ago. And I'm still here. You've been like you've been uh yeah you you've been you've been enjoying you've been having a good time in L.A. though man. Potting it out, man. It's been thought life. Yeah, bro. yeah. <laughs> Potting it out. Uh, my first night, we was at the Highlight Room. Uh, they have this crazy Wednesday party called Sadiq. Sadiq, yeah. It really yep. started out as, as a R and B uh, monthly, I think pre pandemic, and then uh, during the pandemic, you know, they moved it to a rooftop. So it became less of a raging dance party mm-hmm. and more of like a all-star Hollywood who's who. I mean, I went there three consecutive weeks. I saw Drake three consecutive weeks. You know, That's crazy. that dude is the easiest man to find in Hollywood. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, as soon as LeBron was knocked out of the playoffs, he was there, you know. And I don't mean to be on no page six, but these are actual facts. You know, I'm not telling you what people That's facts. Doing. 
Yeah. Who he was rolling with. So that was just three consecutive weeks of just seeing most of the major rappers, you know. But that's that one party, right? Highlight room, right? It's highlight yeah, room on, on Wednesdays, right? Ross, you were there, yeah. right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You, it's you were. Pretty, it's not a, it's not a big, you know, it's an outdoor area. It's not huge, but it's just like every table, you're like Jesus, you know, like. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Really, you know, there's not much to do in LA, I, I think, and everybody you know, is at this party, so. It's like Migos at one, it's like literally Migos at one table, Sway Lee at one table, like Chris Travis Brown. Scott, Chris Brown, Travis Scott, Travis Scott Future, Drake, Future, and then yeah. like the Dreamville yeah. team is over there, you know? Because we run with Night Train, and, and obviously shout out to the homie Night Train. Yeah. He's he's one of the co-residents. I think he's there every other oh, week. Okay. So. How uncomfortable are yeah. these motherfuckers? They're pretty uncomfortable when they're around each other or they're just chill. I feel like there's like, you know, you know, I feel I'm I'm imagining like, you know what I'm saying? Like story or live on a Sunday. You know what I'm saying? Where like when they have these tables, everyone's just kind of looking at each other. Everyone's just trying nah, to. Everybody, nah. Everybody's cool, man. Everybody's cool. It's like, just more laid back. It's, it feels like an industry after party or something. Yeah, everyone's yeah. just chill. That, yeah, know, yeah. Drake, Drake came to our table. He was talking to my brother. He was mad chill. Obviously, Diddy was mad chill. Freddie Gibbs. Chris Brown, Two Chains, Travis Scott, everybody just floating from table to table being cool. I think the whole point of that party is that everybody is just supposed to be like industry peers or whatever. Yeah. Granted, there's yeah. a lot of women trying to get chose. There's a lot of industry <laughs> hanger on, you know, trying to elevate their clout or whatnot. Yeah. So you see a lot of that. But for the most part, yeah. that is pretty, pretty laid back, all celebrity, star studded type of event, you know? You know you so know if you're in LA, <laughs> Don't go because you probably won't get in. Yeah, the yeah. door is crazy. Oh, yeah. You guys are su such name dropping assholes right now. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Momo went off. I didn't even want to say anything, but yeah. Momo went the fuck <laughs> off. Bro, but you know me, right? That, that's not even really my vibe. So I'm literally just reporting from <laughs> yeah. the other side. You know, I'm just like, oh, sharing yeah, with yeah. What I it's saw. like uh, uh, Bill Cosby came up. He did a shot. <laughs> Yo, it was <laughs> crazy. crazy. Yo, Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> walked up to the table. That's crazy. <laughs> Yo, so it's yeah, we had we, we had Thotty D, we had Thotty D two weeks ago. Now we have Thotty Mo. Yeah, Thotty, yeah, it's coming out. Mo, bro. This is like L.A. Mo. It's like Mo doesn't usually stay in L.A. for like more than like a week or so, but like three weeks in L.A. Mo, like L.A. Mo is a different Mo, right? Yeah, yeah. This and is, he's, he's changing. He's ready to sell. Like he's ready to sell. He's ready to make deals and shit in L.A. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is my record length of time I've spent in in L.A. Three consecutive weeks. I've never stayed here so long. You know. I've broken it up. I've gone to the Bay. I've gone. I've gone to Vegas, and I've come back. I haven't actually physically stayed in LA three weeks ever. It gets in the, under your skin, though, right? That kind of that city a little bit, like Hollywood and LA. You know what I'm saying? You get into like cell mode. Like you're ready. Like I feel like there's so many, so many things going on, so many deals on the table when you're in, in that city and shit. Come on. I mean, I, I, I'd say that I would <laughs> if everything that I did was Hollywood or Black Hollywood or celebrity shit. Yeah, yeah. but. We have such a, a really big crew of like ex New Yorkers who moved out here, so we have a whole nother vibe of people. It's also why I'm I'm having such a good time in LA because I have so many friends and family. Yeah, know, yeah. A lot of my peers, but yeah, if I was all on some like star studded Hollywood shit, I I would I would flip, I would switch, I would switch up. You know what I mean for sure. So so we I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on hold on I'm gonna give Momo some props because. Even though I was, you know, LA Momo's been in full effect. He asked me, he's like, yo, you want to grab lunch? And we actually grab lunch. And that's something that doesn't happen in LA. They'd be like, yo, let's grab lunch. And it never happens. Well, that's but because <laughs> in, in New York, we, we commit. We make commitments, right? Wait, wait. Is that a yeah. thing, though? Is that a thing? Like, where That's a thing in LA. Oh, that's okay. a thing in LA. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, LA let's grab LA, lunch and it never happens. You yeah. should hang out. Okay. You should grab lunch. <laughs> it never happens. Because on the day of, you hit somebody up and they'd be like, Oh, I'm in Glendale. This Uber's like sixty five dollars, and it's yeah. just and it's just nonstop flaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never hung out with Momo other than like at the club. <laughs> we never like went on a we never like went on a hike or like saw each other or got lunch or anything like that. We just I think we just knew we're like, oh, fuck, man, you're kind of west, right? LA it's a wrap. Is back, you know, just give it up. Yeah, I'll see you in New York. So I want to uh, talk about everyday people, New York, and I want to know if when this is coming to LA too. But I want to talk about the launch. Of everyday people, June nineteenth, right? For Juneteenth, right. everyday people's coming back. 
How many DJ, right. how many DJs hit you up? Like Mo, how you doing? You know, like you know when you <laughs> how you been, fam? How you been? Fam? How you been, fam? You good? Yo, th hey. thinking about you. Thinking about yeah. you. You hear my Let thoughts? Me tell you, man. Yo, yo. <laughs> hey, DJs, they have a sixth sense, right? They have like a spidey yeah. sense, and they're just like, all right, you know, restrictions are being lifted slowly. Instagram stories are being lit. I sense a party coming on the horizon. <laughs> and then you just get all these random text messages like, my brother, how you been? You know, my mind. I hope you've been good. I'm like, really? I've been on your mind now? For a whole right. month of a pandemic? This is the sure. first time 600,000 people died. I wasn't on your mind? And like a little right. Instagram stories going up and all of a sudden it's like, yo, sending you love and peace and blessings and blah, blah, blah. So my DMs are flooded with that. Like Yo, Mo, I just want you to know I'm just want you to know I'm vaccinated, brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, what's the etiquette though? What's the etiquette though for a DJ to want to hit you up? Should they just be point blank, or like, yo, I'm ready to work. Let me know, you know, when you need me, or should you know how? What's the best way to reach out for a DJ? Well, I mean, for the most part, everything I do is I usually book people from within my community. Yeah. You know what I mean? They could be close friends, or they could just be industry peers. Or people I look up to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so th there's no real etiquette. The etiquette is just like, are we in touch? Are we part of the same community? But what happens is over a pandemic that's lasting for 16 months or still going on, um, you know, that community kind of shrinks a little. You know what I'm saying? Maybe in March of 2020, you're constantly communicating with two to 300 people weekly. And, you know, a year or two, a year later, that number's down to like 30 or 40. So those are the people who are top of mind. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Versus the random dude that just hits you up 15 months later, he just sounds like an opportunist, mm -hmm. like point blank. And what it's done for me, it's because I've always like put a lot of pressure on myself to try to respond to everyone, you know, to try to give everyone a shot. But uh, cats have just been like, ruling themselves out and it's making my life a lot easier so now that i'm coming back and events hopefully are going to start up again in new york i don't have to worry about giving 150 people a shot you know because how the hell do you manage that anyway it's really hard I, I got a few people that i stayed in touch with that showed me that they were truly a part of this community and they kind of like checked for me and i checked for them and those are the people who are going to get the first looks mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying but there is a place for these other guys, these uh, quote unquote opportunists. There's a place for them, right? They're just not a priority at all. You know what I'm saying? It's not a priority. You know, somebody calls out sick, I might holler at a homie. You know what I mean? Right, right. The way I got to where I got in New York is by growing the community, right? Like, you know, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together, right? Y'all know how they say that, right? My good problem is that the community got so big that I felt like I had to give a crazy amount of people a shot. So many mm -hmm. people in in essence that it would impact the quality of the parties, you know, because at some point you befriend people and you get to like people and they're not excellent DJs. You know what I'm saying? They're just kind of like, okay, but they're such good people. You want to give them a shot mm -hmm. and then you put them on and half of their set is dope and the other half is cringe. But you're thinking to yourself, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I'm giving them a look. <laughs> Meanwhile, some of your hosts is rolling their eyes at you like, Mo, what the fuck is going on, you know? So for that whole tier of DJs, if for the past <laughs> year or so, I haven't heard from you. Yeah. <laughs> and you, there's many ways to stay in touch. We don't have to FaceTime. It can be like a little interaction on social media, a little DM here or there, a little text message, a little, yo, let me share this playlist with you. If I haven't interacted with you at all, you just made my job a lot easier where I can just focus on like day ones and top tier homies. Yeah. You know? and, and as a matter of fact, for the first everyday people, for the first two, I'm actually going to DJ both events by myself, you know, all seven hours. Oh, shit. Yeah. So it's going to be like a 14 hour weekend. Oof. And and the reason I'm people people that, are right what writing it watching this writing a text right now and just di delete delete just like you know <laughs> deleting each letter one by one. That's <laughs> right. Text you thinking That's of you right. Mo like G and I. <laughs> yeah, because as you say that the uh, demand you know the demand has become so big for for people asking me for sets that at some point it hurts the party. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring it back to how we started in 2012 
I just had an opening DJ and then I would play for six hours. I'm going to do that for the first two or three and kind of reset the musical tone and the mood. And I'm not the greatest DJ in the world, but I'm good, you know? So the party is going to be good from beginning to end without all like these peaks and valleys. And then once we kind of reestablish that, that's how it's supposed to be, that uh, train wrecking is not acceptable, you know? If I play a six hour set, I might train wreck once or twice. That's, that's cool. It's part of DJing, but you can't be hearing like beats fighting every 15 minutes or like crazy transitions that don't make sense thematically or in BPMs, you know what I mean? And those are the things that I kind of put up with before the pandemic, because I figured they just it's part of the game. Throughout the whole pandemic, all I did was make music and DJ by myself in Zanzibar. And I was like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. You know, mm -hmm. everything is supposed to sound clean. You know what I'm saying? Everything's supposed to make sense. The crowd is supposed to be happy. What that does, as far as that level of expectations, the DJs that I think can do that at everyday people, that list is only down to like 10 to 15. You know what I mean? Me and MoMA have talks about this. Like MoMA is really meticulous, right? About and calculated about what genre of music, what energy of music is playing like every hour to half hour. So like when he does, what what do you, what is everyday people? It's like seven hours pretty much. It's like uh, three to 10 and usually goes to like 11 PM, sometimes midnight. Right. So seven, about six to seven hours or more. He has a plan every hour of, of how, what genre should be played, how it, how the energy should build up and blah, blah, blah. And then you kind of strategically book the DJs in that way. And you try to tell the DJs, stick to this genre of music for this, for your set or whatever, or right? Kind of? You know, I, I never like to tell DJs what to play because it throws them off. Right. You know what I mean? So I try to book DJs who I think are savvy enough that if I put them at a certain set time that corresponds to their strength, that's what they're going to do. Like, if they go off script, I'm like, why are you sabotaging this whole thing, you know? <laughs> I put you at the set time because it's the soca hour and you're a soca DJ. Why are you doing deep house? Because you're trying to like show off your musical chops right now? No, that's not it. You know what I mean? So I don't actually tell DJs what to play. Mm -hmm. I just try to put them in a slot that corresponds to their strength. And I don't also plan out the night that meticulously in terms of uh, genres because they can move around. You right, know, right. Sometimes the hip hop has to hit in the third hour. Sometimes it, to, it has to hit in the fifth hour. Sometimes the Afro beats has to go early, later. The, the R&B classics, they could be in the middle. They could be at the end. It just has to happen at the right time. You know what I mean? And that ability to read the room, to like come up with the right set, to go in the right bag, that only comes with experience. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when you hear your DJs be like, yo, I need to shine. I could kill it. Yeah, you probably could. But in order to hold this room down for like five or six hours, you have to understand, you know, when to go in each bag. And mm -hmm. what I've seen at Everyday People is a lot of people that I've given looks to, young and old and veterans. You got some real trigger happy mugs out there, right? I've seen him like ruin the vibe or like damage the arc of the party or kill the energy too early on, on the late night side. You know what I mean? And every and every single time I got to hop on with like a fucking fire extinguisher and put the fire out and fix it. And I, and I would keep doing it. And while I was in Zanzibar, while I was in South Africa, I was thinking to myself, why do I have to keep doing it? You know what I'm saying? Why do I have to come clean up after messy DJs? I'm like, I'm done with that shit. You know what I mean? It's just, it's gonna be me. It's gonna be the people I trust, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be the people who can show me something. As far as anybody that's entitled for a set, just because you know they think they're lit or they think they got a certain amount of followers, or because they've been coming to the party routinely and they constantly support, which I, you know, I'm, I'm truly grateful for. That no longer entitles you to a set. You know, the only thing that entitles you to a set is being an excellent DJ. I've I've seen you tap motherfuckers on the shoulder though, who like try to play swag surfing at like you know yeah, I've at, done that. I've at done the that. third hour. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. I'd be like, no, no, no. I, I just go like this. I'm like, too early, too early, too early. We got six more hours to go. Just and look it's at also them. inexcusable at that party because you can play almost anything at that party. That crowd is so open. It's their mu It's a very knowledgeable crowd when it comes to music. So you can take it in any direction. You could do a easily an hour of bad boy R&B classics and kill it 
there's just no need to be like hammering shit at 5 p.m., you know, 6 p.m., and then making it oh, just making anybody's job harder for the rest of the night. I, when I DJ that party, you usually put me on kind of on the late side, prime time, and I'm always like, yo, I want to play some classics. I got an idea. Like, I might play a little like New York classics. And you're like, you know what? Like, do like play some club shit. Like, I want you to like just hit them over the head right now. And that's, you know, like that's why you have me at that time slot. So I even have to like fight the urge to be like taking it to Luther Vandross, which is maybe where I want to go when it's clear that the, that the room is like, yo, it's just got to be full on current hip hop. You, you, you're a professional DJ. And then there's a the few times you've done it in LA. You came in, you hit him right upside the head, 70 BPM, exactly what the doctor prescribed. And then you kind of did your thing. You went a little bit more old school, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and then you brought it back, you know, and, and that's the beauty of it. Like, you want, you want to rock in prime time, you got to do what the room dictates. You want yeah. to go early, you want to go late, you can get open, you know? And that's literally all it is. It's funny. I, I had a yeah. conversation with, uh, I was at Encore Beach Club with Ross last week. And a conversation with a DJ who, like, maybe maybe four years ago, four maybe three to four years ago, like, he, he used to open for me at Omnia, right? Good DJ, really good DJ, but he was just, like, kind of, like, just young, just like a little, like, you know, just, he was kind of on the mic. He was like, he was going like kind of going crazy and like not really playing for girls and stuff. So, and then the one thing that really got on my nerves was that, you know, when we switched over, he just kind of unplugged his headphones and I had to like unscrew his, you know, his needles and his records. And I was just kind of like, yo, it's like, can you unscrew your shit? So at the end of the night, I came to him and I talked to him. I'm like, yo, there's like a courtesy for a couple of things like yo like learn how to loop out your shit or learn to loop some shit out and switch over with the com you know hand me the usb cord if possible you know like you know help me put my vinyl on and my needles on when <laughs> while you're playing you know what i'm saying right, right. it's like when you unplug and then you kind of like just like back off it's like well i gotta do all of this shit which i don't mind doing but you know yeah I, but it does create a weird energy like yeah. when someone does that you know and then I mean? and then he kind of like and I, I talked to a few openers over there and then and then i was like you know i was kind of like yo do you, you know i'll come I, I didn't realize how insulting this sounded but i was like yo i'll even come early pause i'll come through early like at 11 and i was like and i'll show you how to open you know and i know that comes off as like really fucking rude or whatever <laughs> but like he kind of like you know we was uncomfortable when we, we see each other but then when we saw each other that last week, he just, you know, we were talking. He's like, yo, man, like, I just want to say you were absolutely right four or five years ago. Like, I really didn't realize how to, like, open a room until I started DJing six hours. And I realized that there's an arc to a night. And he's like, I didn't realize some of the shit I was playing could have been played two hours later. And I could have been, you know, he's like, I didn't really realize it until I started DJing the whole night. And really, like, having to go through a whole catalog of music and you know he was and he learned this um kind of when when vegas was half open yeah. and, they, and they and they are they were having like the djs uh at excess and encore beach club do like literally open to close right so it's i think it's his first time really doing the whole night so but he yeah. learned about the arc on like how to hold back songs and how to slowly build it up and build it up and then really hit him over the head and then kind of like bring it bring it back down before, right before closing but then bring bring it back up you know what i mean so he was right. just and we was talking about it and it was it was one of those things where i thought it was kind of beautiful that he understood it like later on like that we were able to have a conversation about that but it's so yeah. tough it's so tough to let some of these young djs know like yo you're not you're not doing it right and they take it so personally and it's like I wish they would understand, like, yo, you're just going to be, you're a good DJ. You're going to be better, but you need to work on this shit. And it's just one of those things. You know what I mean? I don't know. This is frustrating. No, you're absolutely right. But, you know, it comes with experience. Yeah. And you can't really fault the, the younger DJs because nah. they, didn't, they didn't grow up in, in an environment where you might open from 10 to 12 for the headliner. Yeah. And then close from 3 to 4. They grew up in an environment where there's like six DJs on the bill. Yeah. You know what I mean? They've like I've seen parties in LA where last calls at one forty five, they have four or five DJs on. 
Why? But, dog, I've, I've been part of a, uh, of a night where there were six DJs and the party was about four hours long and DJs had 30 minutes to 15 minutes to 45 minutes. What's the point? Like, not only can you not express yourself or do anything coherent or cohesive, you're not even going to learn, mm. you know, that skill set. You're never going to learn it. You're only going to get your nut off real quick and the next DJ is going to do the same thing and it's going to, and it's a cycle. And mm. then... Pre-pandemic, one thing that kind of became acceptable throughout the country, which used to be unacceptable, is hearing the same song multiple times, right? So it used to be acceptable to hear the song, the brand new songs when you walked in the club. You know, you'd hear them. So the DJ would let you know, I'm going to play some new shit. And then you'd hear them again in prime time. Or maybe the DJ would play it in prime time and run it again late. Mm-hmm. But then pre-pandemic, people were like, oh, yeah, he, he played this new Drake record four times already. And that's insane. You know what I'm saying? But the reason why a lot of promoters had to book so many DJs is because they're, they rely on the DJs for the promotion. Yeah. What I'm telling these promoters, I'm not trying to put DJs out of work right now, but what I'm telling these promoters is post-pandemic, you don't need that. You don't need eight DJs to have your party sold out. People are so eager to come out. You know, and they're so eager to just get together and congregate. Book a smaller number of DJs, you know, two to three, four at the most, you know, and make sure that they sound good together and then try to come up with some sort of game plan to give people like an experience that makes sense. And then maybe we can get back to something better. Yeah. Isn't it just lazy? It's lazy promotion, though, right? Because they, they're, they're banking on the DJs following to come through. So they need, you know, six to eight DJs. Everyone, like each DJ brings 10 to 20 people. They need those people to come to the event. So that's why they're doing that, right? A lot of times that's the incentive, right? They make the DJ have to bring that many people just to get the slot. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's mostly you got to sell X amount of tickets for you to be on the bill. Yeah. So that's how it used to work in LA. Yeah. But, you know, it's, I don't know if it's so much like lazy promotion. It's more so that these dudes are not even promoters to start with. You yeah. Know? Right. Talking about people with Instagram accounts. And Photoshop, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they put and they just throw anything at the wall and hope that something sticks. And then you got your Martin Luther King weekend event with like, you know, a U.S. flag in the background of the flyer and, and this image of MLK and some girl twerking in front of some bottles. That's <laughs> that person's not a promoter. You know what I mean? That's just somebody who put something together on Instagram and threw a bunch of DJs at it, and they just hope that people come out. So, and 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 that scenario. The DJs, they're innocent bystanders, man. They're victims. You know, they're being thrown to the wolves. Like, old school promoters have their database of people that follow them, that trust them. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to rely on DJs so much. So, yeah, it, it is lazy promotion, but it's less that. It's more the fact that these guys are just bots. They're bots throwing parties. You know what I mean? I do feel like the li like live streaming for these DJs, especially the young DJs, have helped a lot. Like, they've really... Because a lot of them stream for like four to five hours, you know what I'm saying, and they and they've kind of like built out their um their music catalog, and if they're doing it multi multiple times a week, they gotta search for new music. They're listening to other DJs play for three to four hours. They're learning more. They're like seeing more. So I think live streaming for a lot of young DJs has been like a godsend. You know what I'm saying? Like it's really helped a lot. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a crash course instead of taking the 16 week uh, course. It was a four week course and now you gain acknowledgement from your peers, higher like great DJs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like these new DJs will never get noticed by a Z trip, but now you could because Z trip just has to click a few links and he's there. So That's it's, right. it, it, it made things a lot easier. Like Serato made it easier for DJs. Twitch made it a lot easier for DJs to come up and make an impact. Right. Yeah. And, and to your point, Whereas before DJs had, you know, 30, 45 minutes to prove themselves. Now they can air out, you know, they can play at yeah, home yeah. 90, two hours, three hours. They can actually get better and really understand how to play this music. And I've seen it. I've seen it in New York. Um, there's a couple of DJs who really was so consistent between Twitch and like online radio and shit like that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, a woman named Jada Lorraine. One of these really dope DJs that ran with us, we always booked her. And just this past year, like her profile 
is just elevated to the next level where, you know, she's headlining venues as soon as they reopen. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Cause she's like top of mind and she's like, she really like proved her chops. So I think, I think Twitch has been great for young DJs and it's been great for like veterans too. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it really has been great for veteran DJs because they, you know, that core following there is still at home and you know, they're not going out as much and it's been perfect. It's been like their own personal radio station that they could really just transmit to their following from like the past 30 years or more, you know, and, and they're all loyal till now. I mean, it's been, Listen, it's been dope. When, when you're a young DJ, you, you think to yourself, how can I travel the world DJing and making money? You know? And when you get a bit older, you think to yourself, how can I stay at home DJing and making money? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's working out great, man. It's funny. Um, I, I was DJing uh, a few clubs, you know, this, the past few weeks. And all of these managers and, like, you know, bookers are telling me they're, like, crooked. Like, who, who, where are the other bottle service DJs that can, like, read a room? There seems to be like a drought of young generation DJs who can read a room and like play for bottle service rooms. And I was like, well, there isn't a drought on like bottle service DJs. I know a lot of motherfuckers that can rock a room. Yeah, they but like, yeah, but we want like the, the younger version. Basically, they want like the cheaper version, like the young kids who are coming up. And I'm like, I don't know if there is a generation like that coming up. I think like maybe... You know, like Night Train is the first guy I could think of. You know what I'm saying when I was talking to people, but I don't, I don't know if that's, you know what I mean. Like I don't know if that's something that a DJ, like a DJ nowadays, a young DJ wants to be, whereas that's something they wanted to probably be like 10, 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? I, I agree with you. To me, Night Train is pretty much a veteran by now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That that boy's been at it, but I, I don't know. I don't maybe the incentive. The incentive isn't there for, for us the incentive to to rock commercial and bottle service clubs early on was that the money was great yeah yeah you know what i'm saying so we aspired to be you know at djs are also the best too yeah it was like yeah. the best djs in new york did those kind of rooms back then that's right so and, and the money was go good. and listen and learn the money was was decent you know it was good but like it was more like you could not fuck with like stretch riz mm -hmm. Eric Lepoe, all those dudes like back then, you'd go out and check them out. And it was like, to me, it was just like, other than like hearing mixtape and radio DJs, I was like, yo, these guys are like the most talented dudes, you know, by far. And they're rocking like these clubs and like the scene is crazy. And um, they're putting together like these, these well thought out, super fast sets. Just like the inspiration was definitely there. And now I don't know if a young kid coming out, if they're ne necessarily going to be inspired by any part of it, you know, the DJ, the club, the, the money element of it, the bottle element. I don't know if that's like what a young person is necessarily uh, interested in. Maybe they are, but uh, you I, know. Feel, I feel like it's not exposed on social media as much as some of these other elements of, of DJing, you know what I'm saying? So like, some of these, like, uh, like the Red Bull three style, like turntablism, like routines, yeah. you know, like yeah. um, TikTok DJing. There's all of these other elements of DJing that are going viral. And in bottle service, like, you know, the most you'll see is like a recap video from a nightclub, you know, but you'll never yeah. really understand, like, really rocking a crowd outside of like cryo and confetti <clears throat> and like bottle girls with sparklers. Like, you'll never really experience how to really control or watch a DJ control and rock a room with multiple tables, you know, like a table that wants reggaeton, a, a table that wants down South, a, a table that wants uh, EDM pop and just like bring everyone together and have everyone continuously spend money and stay there and have the energy high. Like it's, it's not something you can capture on social media. So I feel I like you, you there's know? a real stigma too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, over the last like 10 years, there's been a real stigma about like bottle service DJs and uh, the blame is to go around from the DJs to the clubs. Like everybody shares the blame in that. Right. But I'm saying like the fact of the matter is when I used to be a, someone like coming up and going out and watching DJs, it was no question. Like these DJs had the best record collections, had the deepest musical knowledge, were able to rock the most genres could do like R and B rock reggae, good dance hall set, good hip hop, good classics. You know, it was like they could do everything and it was always clean, always on point and always like moving. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like 
moving, no stalling. That's changed now because now, you know, like we were saying before, it's more just go in and like smack them with hits, let the song run. A little bit less emphasis on like the flow of a night, which I think is probably why the, why younger DJs and stuff, they don't go out and they don't really, uh, that the flow of the night thing doesn't necessarily hit them. When, when we were going out, it was like so clear what you played at what time. And like, obviously that ended up getting a little stagnant, but they did that because it worked. It kept your club packed till 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. and it kept the vibe until 4 a.m. And you could like, you could get out of that. Obviously EDM threw like the biggest monkey wrench in the whole shit, you know? And, and then kind of 70 BPM hip hop. I think for a young person, it's probably really hard to like go to a club and like get a sense of the, of a flow of a night, especially yeah. if there's four DJs. But even if there's one DJ and they're going from, you know, 70 BPM Migos up to, you know, Tiesto and, and all in the span of this hour almost, you know, it's like, it's just different, you know, it's a different vibe. I think to your point, Crooked, it has a lot to do with, with the content side of it. And I never thought about it until you just said it. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything is so content driven. It's very, you can capture the energy of a festival in 15 seconds. You can yeah. capture the energy of 10,000 people swag surfing at Duce Palooza, you know, or like a beach party. But out, outside of like, was it like compressed air and confetti? It's really hard to capture the energy of a bottle service nightclub mm -hmm. because there's also such little energy there to capture in the yeah. first place. So I think for, as far as attracting younger DJs to want to become elite bottle service um, DJs, I think there's a PR issue there for the nightlife. Do they care? Yeah. Maybe they don't, but they're going to start caring when they're going to look around and realize that there are no young, affordable DJs coming up next and that some of us who may have priced ourselves out they might have to come back and meet our rates you know what I mean no see like I'm, I'm fine yeah. I'm fine being you know the last of the Mohicans you know what I'm saying <laughs> I'm okay with that you know like I, I you know I'm gonna continuously get booked and stuff but I thought it was interesting you know that there's not really like there was 10 10 15 years ago, like everybody wanted to be in bottle service. Yeah. And like now, like, you know, no, everyone's like, I want to play what I want to play. You know, like I want to, I, I want to, like, you know, I want to make music like, yeah. and I want, I want it to be a vibe. I want it to be my own, what I want to do. And I'm like, yeah, that's power dope, to you know, yeah. and I think well, that's not, dope, but yeah. The younger yeah. DJs I've talked to, it, like having their own party is more attractive than playing in, yeah, in yeah. the night, nighttime. You know what I mean? Like they want to sure. start their own thing, start their own, like, yeah community like Mo was saying and like that to them is like the pinnacle right now the family from the younger djs i've talked to well it was it was yeah. so hard to break into the club scene 10 years ago when you guys were doing such a great job and shit like that because uh even last night me and moma and nitro were hanging out and nitro said it to us Momo. he said yo it took me about eight years to crack into this circle in la and it took him that long because that's how long it really is. There's so many politics, here, especially here in LA, in New York, I don't know, but that's why there was never another generation. Unless you stuck by like a night train and really dug it out, people would rather just go throw their party with their friends at an empty fucking parking lot. Yeah. So that's why there was no real desire yeah. to the become the next the next mm. up and coming bottle service DJ because there was no room to get in. Yeah. And we're talking a lot about DJ Night Trains. Shout out to Night Trains. Yeah. <laughs> this is a plug. It took him. It took him eight years to crack through the LA scene, right? Yes. But during those eight years, what's on his resume, right? He's DJing for Boss. He's doing shit with J Cole. Doing shit with the Kardashians. Doing shit with uh, basketball players. He had still have to have like this Diesel resume just in order to crack the rotation of these LA DJs, which and is. And, yeah. yeah, and 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 meanwhile, this this whole time he 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 still looks like a busboy at a nightclub. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's crazy? I, uh, I remember. It, uh, one I of love your night chain. I love you. I'm just fucking with you. I'm no, we, with we, you. we're fucking around. Yeah, um, it's just it's too much love. So we gotta, you know, we gotta even it out. No, you know gotta, what's crazy? We gotta even it out. Okay. You okay. know what's crazy? I, I I grew up in a, like going to the club and seeing Ross one, and to me Ross handled one of the you know he would handle playhouse like like it was nothing and nitro was part of that thing too where he would go see ross one because when the first everyday people i went to um 
Nitrogen was get he's he's set to go up, and Ross Swan walked in and he's like, "Oh fuck, I'm nervous now." And I said, "Why?" He's like, "Dude, I grew up watching Ross Swan. Now he's gonna hear what? me." What shit, man? And then I God, was just like, "You guys are making me blush, man." Hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. And then I was just like, "Oh shit, he's part of that generation that would go watch DJs." control a room and know what works at certain times mm -hmm. and i was that was i was just like oh shit maybe me and him are like part of the last people that want to go see bottle service djs and learn yeah. how to dj like that but yeah it was more so way. because same way if stretch walks in or if some, you know if somebody walks in i'm djing one of those dudes who i i'm like i just shut down you know i'm or god forbid riz walks into a club and i'm, DJ, I'm just like oh fuck me you know like yeah, don't make me do, know, don't make me do this don't make me try to dj in front of these guys it's the same thing you know like so the thing about bottle service yeah. djs is that granted you know you have to be talented to do that stuff mm -hmm. but it's incredibly tactical right it's so much more tactical than anything else like the way you control a room the way you manage uh the management the celebrities yeah, yeah. To have certain yeah. songs on deck so it's this whole other skill set that you don't see at a first glance you know what i mean the fucking anxiety the anxiety at first it. glance all you see is like i don't know like you know bottles sparklers and some rapper in the booth with you you know what i'm saying but there's so much that goes beyond that and and, and so for the younger generation they're gonna be like i'd rather just have vibes you know? yeah yeah what the fuck yeah. is this i'd rather just have vibes it's crazy because even when I, I've like, you know, I've I've started to get back into it, like even me reading the room, I'm like literally like, yo, dance floor is good. They're they're continuously buying. They look like they want reggaeton, so I'm gonna play it. But then there's that other table, right? They want hip hop. So I'm literally scanning the room and I'm looking at tables and I'm like I'm I'm like I'm kind of like making stereotypes a little bit. Like oh, maybe they're gonna like this. I put this one song Okay, they're wilding out. I'm going to keep going. I lost that table, though. I got to bring it back to that table after two songs. You know, and then and then you look at the crowd. The crowd's good. And then there's, like, two two dudes in the crowd who was, like, requesting to me to play, like, Still Fly, like, you know, uh, what is it called? Big Timers or some shit. And I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's like, at this point, like, you guys have, like, one drink in your hand, and I have these other tables that are spending $10,000, you know? Yeah. But those two guys would never understand why I didn't play their request. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because cause, cause they're looking at like, yo, I paid a mission. I bought a drink. I'm like, yeah, but look at these tables that I got to deal I with. I stood in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I got I to gotta focus on these tables and see what they're doing. Then I got the manager coming up. Yo, I need you to play the Rocky theme, which I didn't know motherfuckers still do, but apparently they're still playing the Rocky theme. They still want to feel you like... the Rocky theme uh, right now coming out of uh, yeah. the lockdown? Yeah. I, they were like, do you have the Rocky theme? Yeah. I'm like, of course I have the Rocky theme. <laughs> That's also in summary why like kids don't want to, you know, yeah. put up with it. You know, like that, yeah. you pretty much sum it up with that one too. Like yeah. that, that was a big but, thing that changed. But where, for me now, it's like, cool. Like, know. all right, now, now I don't have to, now I can like, you know, just drop a big song. The transition. Right yeah. That's a transition <laughs> for me. Like now I can switch BPMs and I can go here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like. So like it's just how you how you work the shit, but I mean it it is it can yeah. be really stressful, but I mean you know when it comes down to it, that's why that's why I appreciate something like everyday people. And let me let me explain yeah. everyday people for uh, so for some of you that haven't been listening to this podcast. I think we've been talking about everyday people for the past three to four years. That they we've are had our this longest. <laughs> they are our longest sponsorship that we've ever had in this <laughs> in this podcast. Now, like everyday people is a it's a day party. It's one of my favorite, all of our favorite parties. You'll have yeah. everything, right? From dance hall, reggae, Afro beats, soca, hip hop, R and B. It's just to me the best party in the world. To me that I've ever seen. And it like when I go there, I just it just hits my soul. So if you've never been to an everyday people party, you have to go. At least you you definitely have to go in the next year or so, especially when they're relaunching post pandemic. Um, I'm not getting paid for any of this. You understand? Like I'm you're not even to, getting booked for yeah. any of this. And if you, yeah, yeah. You can, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> this I'm is like thinking thinking of you, Mama. How you been? <laughs> you you even healthy? You pay for dinner when we go out for Korean. Know. This is how yeah. little you're getting out of this deal. Yeah. Yo, yo. 
I've never asked Mo to DJ this ever in my life. Like, I've never hit him up. I just say, when is the next shit so that I can just go? Because when I go, it, like, feeds my soul, and I'm happy, and I learn so much, and I get to, and I, I look at beautiful people dancing and enjoying themselves. It's, it's to me, the greatest party ever. So, on that note, you guys are relaunching June 19th, this Saturday, in New York. You announced it on Instagram, and there was interesting comments on your Instagram. Right. Because on because for this weekend, the, everyone needs to show proof of vaccination, right, in order to That's enter right, the yeah. party. So, yeah, because the, the venues are operating with these protocols and reduced uh, capacities. Mm-hmm. So we announced actually for the first time two back-to-back everyday peoples in the same city. So we're doing Saturday, June 19th in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. We're doing Saturday, uh, June 20, uh, uh, Sunday, June 20th, also in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, we're doing Knockdown Center and elsewhere. So we're like, you know what, let's just throw two parties, two consecutive days. We know the demand is going to be there, especially with the reduced capacities. Currently, New York State law and, and the State Liquor Authority, they mandate that for a large-scale party to happen without social distancing and optional mask-wearing policy that uh, everyone has to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So if it's two shots of Moderna or two shots of Pfizer or one shot of Johnson & Johnson, you got to wait the two weeks after that, too, to be fully immunized. That's the only way you can have a party without uh, social distancing, because frankly, everyday people with social distancing would be sad, right? Mm-hmm. So Fucking depressing, depressing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to a mask policy. Masks, they should be optional. If you feel comfortable wearing a mask and you want to keep it on, you know, do you, right? But mostly, um, most of your parties are outdoor. They're not usually indoor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. So when you so say most that, of the you say that. outdoor. Yeah. So we we knew there was going to be some some backlash. Obviously. Did you anticipate it? Really? Did you anticipate it? I anticipated it um, because you know the minority is always louder than the silent majority. If that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, you're dropping so, some gems. You're dropping some gems today. You know, like if, if someone is in agreement with your post, they're gonna like it. You're going to get 5,000 likes. If someone's in disagreement, they're going to comment. Mm-hmm. You're going to get 300 comments. So there's a huge disparity there between the amount of people in agreement and disagreement. But the people disagreeing, they're the ones who take shit personal. Yeah. No one takes it personal when you agree with them. They, they fucking love it. That, you know? I mean, there was, there was a lot of harsh comments in there. Uh, there was tremendous <laughs> backlash from the anti-vaxxer community. Can I? Tremendous. Um, can I read some of the comments a little bit? Back yourself out. <laughs> yeah, they were coming in hot, bro. I woke up and I was like, oh, shit, it's on fire. So, so the anti-vaxxers were saying, you know, proof of vaccination. Yeah, sorry, y'all losing me on that, right? That was one. The fuck is the proof of va- vaccination bullshit, you know? Guess I won't be supporting this event anymore, right? <laughs> Here's a here's a one I love. I hope no one shows up to these events. <laughs> y'all out of your minds, right? Another one. Really? One word, simple. Segregation, right? <laughs> That's a good one. This medical apartheid. Yeah. You know, no. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. another one? Oh, wow. I think I saw like concentration camp dropped in there somewhere. Oh, I saw, I, there were some wild ones. But I I just wanted to, I'm, I still need you to do that post that how long did it take for both days to sell out? They both parties sold out in three hours. <laughs> three hours sold yeah. out. So. Yeah. Yo, so you can't even walk up and try See, to get in yeah, anymore? Yeah. See, We're Ross, not, it's so all good. It's a good door. See, Ross, I was going to make a joke and be like, so, be... MoMA, you've been struggling to, to move tickets, right? Oh, Obviously, oh my it... <laughs> You could edit it. Edit it. I was going to be like, hey, Mo, you've been struggling to sell tickets, right? He's like, no, actually, we sold out in three hours. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, man, I'm sorry. I should have known you had a plan. You know, I, I it, loved it so much. Crazy? I was just like. We, what's crazy is we put the disclaimer in the caption on, right. on the ticket link. To New York State mandates. This is how the venue, this is the only way the venue can operate. Uh, and, and the regulations are changing. Restrictions could be eased overnight. We don't know what's going on. This may be just for the first event. Just just bear with us, right? Mm-hmm. And and the anti-vaxxer community, I mean. They forgot to read. It's, <laughs> I don't know if they forgot to read or if it's reading comprehension or a combination of the two. But our IG comments is like a dumpster fire, man. It's a dumpster fire. And I was just like, let me not touch it. 
let me watch the community kind of regulate itself. And it did. And, and they, yeah, they and did. It, it did. A yeah. lot of people were making some very valid points. So, there were some people in there who were so smart, like they knew about securing permits. They knew about the difference of throwing a jam in the park mm -hmm. versus throwing a mini festival in an establishment with liquor licenses and all of that. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of these people were kind of speaking on our behalf, defending what's going on. And there were a lot of anti-vaxxers who had really uh, like justifiable concerns about you know the, the science behind uh, the vaccine and side effects and all of that. But there was a lot of people just spewing misinformation, like yeah. wild shit. And um, it, it, was, it was a great, I don't want to say social experiment, because I don't want to think of myself as a puppeteer. But <laughs> it, it was very interesting to watch. And, you know, and it's also very interesting to see, like, um, motherfuckers show their faces. You know what I mean? Did you it's one thing did you recognize an did, But did you recognize and, some homies or people that you knew? Oh, hell that, yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Oh Listen, wow. It, it's one thing if you have like anti-vaccination sentiments. I totally respect that, right? And go ahead, this is social media, you know? Speak your peace. But if you're my homie and you know this is my party <laughs> and it's my livelihood, this is not the time to get on your soapbox. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because yeah. I'm gonna remember that. Yeah. I'll be like, oh, you the one that was shitting on me. When our hands was tied, when we couldn't throw a party for 16 months, mm -hmm. when this is the only way we can put some money in our pockets, this is the only way for the venue and their staff to reopen and feed their families, you thought this was the right time to kind of like spew your conspiracy theories. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to remember that. You know, it's, it's- Also, it's a private event. Just just don't go. Just shut the fuck up. You, no one's telling you to get vaccinated. No one's telling you what to do. Just we, we're concerned about our health and the health of the people who- support us and this is what it is but that but like that's, it. it's but all that, good but don't that's why vaccine, but like don't you don't need to make a comment about it i'm not on your shit commenting about your choices that's why they're just, mad though. it just blew, blew my mind but that's why they're huh? mad because they can't go you know what i'm saying yeah well you <laughs> like, know what you can enjoy literally... it on social media but like <laughs> Even Desus and Mero commented, right? Mero from Desus well, Mero, and Mero. Yeah, he had the best one of all time. <laughs> he said, yo, the holistic crystal energy essential oil mob came through in the comments, yo. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yo, it's funny it's, because... I'm, I'm not going to touch that comment. I'm not going to touch that comment. I know. That, yeah, that's the best comment. <laughs> I get the stand. Listen, anybody who's about a holistic lifestyle, mm -hmm. and, you know... Just, no, no, it's not, obviously. No, I mean, it's... it's, it's, uh, it's obviously, sar people, sarcasm. you respect... You respect people's decision if they don't want to get a vaccine that's that on them you know that's but right. like to come at someone for first following the law and second being concerned about the health of them of their people like it's this you know it's six hundred thousand people dead it's not like just some some game out here if you don't want to get a vaccine it's all good but i went to a party with ellie's party that required vaccine people were wiling out in there but like you got to show your shit when you go in and, it, it, and they don't even allow the paper. You got to do full on, you know, you Excelsior need to have a real legit pass digital thing, you know, because, you know, they take it really seriously. It's, that, it's just not a, over. You know what I mean? That's Ellie Escobar's party, right? That he DJs? Well, he's, he's a resident at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, that party's heck. What's it called? It was crazy. <laughs> Battle called him. Battle Him. Battle Him. Battle him. It's amazing. Like yeah. looking at uh, some of the recap videos uh, from Ellie yeah, Escobar's yeah. IG. That party looks bananas. Just like really yeah, dope. It's disco literally in bananas. House. Yeah, yeah. I mean that party. It's is not. A, yeah, is it's a it's tech. It's a throwback to like late '80s New York dance parties yeah. before smartphones. When oh man, yeah. when no phones are out. Dancing. Wild, wild energy. And, you know, another amazing party like that is Poppy Juice. Poppy Juice, yeah. uh, Brooklyn. Shout out to those guys. They, you know, it, it, generally, the best parties in New York are all the ones that are thrown by the LGBTQ plus community, you know? Yeah. And, and if everyday people falls in that realm, it's because we have such strong support from that community. You know what I mean? It's, it's crazy to think, you know, like for the past year, for you guys launching in New York, everyday people right now, I mean, you guys are kind of like the first, one of the first parties to launch right now, right? Kind of. It, like, everyone has parties, you know, there's 
Peach Fuzz in Miami. There's 143 in LA. There's Shaba. There's all these dudes, but you're kind of like the first guys to kind of come back. Before you answer that, I'm going to break out, but I'll see you guys soon. Peace, all right. peace. Ross. All right, Ross. Yeah, good seeing all you guys. All right, one. All right, all right man. Peace. Easy. Yeah, I think we're just, we're one of the first of, of many dominoes, and it mostly has to do with how advanced New York State is in vaccinations. You know, just mm-hmm. today, we, we had 70% of adults with at least one dose of the vaccine, which is the threshold that uh, Cuomo wanted to reach before easing all restrictions. So it's very ironic that, you know, the anti-vax community was so incensed because it's very possible that these requirements, these restrictions are eased before the party on Saturday. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's very possible that we may be able to open up additional tickets for both. Now, my only concern is this. I'm vaccinated. So I'm ready to party with non-vaccinated people, right? Mm-hmm. But I promoted a party that's vaccine only on Monday to people who are all vaccinated, but they may, they may or may not be as willing to party with unvaccinated people as, mm-hmm. like I am. You know what I mean? Right. So I have to think about what do we do if before Saturday Cuomo eases all restrictions? Is it then just a free for all or do we keep it? backs only just for this weekend so we don't get you know another backlash from the vaccinated audience because then everybody's just shooting the messenger you know what i mean you have We're to kill everyone well that's when you have to put a yellow neck brace over the people's necks who who aren't vaccinated so you can spot them <laughs> easily why do you let this guy talk man <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yo you- mo did you did you feel oh go ahead kirk no 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 i i'm no no go ahead i i was actually gonna ask at what point did you feel comfortable to say, like, yo, we're ready to do this. We're ready to come out. You know, we're ready. I think it's one thing that uh, last year they were talking about airborne transmission outside. Yeah. And very early on, that really didn't make sense to me because you're talking in parts per million, you know? You're talking in parts per million, talking about air changes, an infinite amount of air changes. And you, you know my background in engineering, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I just don't see it. I don't see how you could jog past someone and contract, uh, you know, COVID. But I never put my hand up and said, oh, that don't make sense. Because you got to stay in line with society. Like, we're all learning together. The minute the CDC said that outdoor transmission is zero to none, that's when I felt comfortable. You know, it's almost kind of reinforced that outdoor transmission is zero to none. Now, our events are outdoor. That's great. But our events are super packed. Yeah. So I, you still got a factor for that. So then I, at that point, I was like, all right, well, CDC said outdoors is good to go. Now I just need Cuomo to say 70% threshold of vaccination is reached. And as of like two weeks ago, we were at like 62, 63%. You know, we track that shit daily, man. We're borderline like CDC interns at this point. Right. You know, it was a combination of all of those things. And it was also the last thing, which was equally important, is maybe having the um, assurance that the community wouldn't look at us as being irresponsible Mm -hmm. if we threw an event. And if we had done one in April, they might have could have looked at us that way. You know what I mean? But there was an overwhelming feeling where, listen, we're ready to be outside. We know there's risk involved, but everybody's taking personal responsibility. I think that that's where New York is right now. Everybody's talking about personal responsibility. But whereas, you know, eight months ago, six months ago, it was like, nah, y'all are crazy. Y'all mm-hmm. are reckless. Y'all are behaving like Atlanta and Miami. And y'all are out here, you know, developing new variants. Now everybody's just like, well, we just ready to be outside. We vaccinated for the most part. And we understand the risk involved. So now I feel comfortable throwing the party. And what I'm telling people is don't sleep on the parties. And granted, nobody did, right? They sold out in three hours. Yeah. But it's carpe diem at this point. Who knows if we're going to get locked down again in two months? Mm-hmm. New York True. reopening, L.A. reopening. You know what that means? That means Muggs is going to come to New York and L.A. from all over, unvaccinated, variant carrying. You know, who knows what that's going to do? So if you can hang out in July, in August, get it in, man. I'm, I'm not an optimist. I'm not really a pessimist. I'm just a realist. I've seen South Africa open up and get locked down again. Yeah. I've seen Europe open up 
and get locked down again. You know, I've seen overall recklessness in Brazil threatening the entire population. So um, just get it in, man. Seize the day. But I, I don't think people account for that. Like the venues and a lot of big, large corporations are like kind of still on the fence. They're not really investing all their money to like everything's going to fully open for the summer. They're kind of oh. holding back. So like we have yeah. no sponsors. Yeah, we have no sponsors, and people don't realize that. People think it's over. Like yeah. I was literally talking with Jamie about the pan. He's like, "When do you think the pandemic's gonna end?" I'm like, "Dude, this is not gonna end. It's just like we're just gonna have to live with this shit forever. Like, and it's gonna go down. It might become like chicken pox, or I don't know what the fuck. I'm not, you know, I'm an idiot, so don't yeah. listen to me. But it's not going away. And if you talk to a lot of these companies, sponsors, venues, large large arenas and venues they're they're not like yo we're all good they're like we don't know what's gonna happen so there's still everyone's on the fence and it, it's been kind of hard for you to find venues right it's a lot of venues closed a lot of venues are kind of like some are following uh the cdc regulations some aren't it's just like and you have to be responsible for your crowd and and everything so there's all these things that come into play that people don't even know the logistics are crazy right now you know I mean, our biggest venue in, in, in New York, and I'm not going to name drop them, but everybody who co who comes to the parties in New York, mm -hmm. they know who they are. They haven't decided whether or not they're going to do events yet or when they're going to start doing events. You know what I mean? Our, our number one venue in L.A., they switched their model, you know, from like day parties, day clubs, nightclubs to more of a restaurant because they're like, you know, we make a lot of money with on the food and beverage side of things on the restaurant and it's a socially distanced environment so it's kind of like covid proof you know in case shit goes off the rails again which it might i i, I use the term pre-pandemic a lot mm -hmm. i never use the term post-pandemic <laughs> what i say i use the term post lockdown you know what i mean because yeah, we're still in the pandemic and yeah, yeah. by all accounts covid is here to stay forever yeah, I've been saying post-pandemic, but, you know, that's just me. Don't listen to nah. me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you, you already know not to listen to me, so, you know. Don't yeah. listen to the genius when I say over post, here. When I say post-pandemic, you already know. Crooked, you know. That's crooked. That's uh, crooked. That's crooked's <laughs> lingo. Have you talked to other, other like, you know, other DJs, all the, all the homies with parties and what they're trying to do? And are they kind of learning from you a little bit? Like, are you giving them advice and they're saying like let me know what happens you know how's the rollout i'm sure they're already gonna know like after seeing Absolutely. the comments about anti from anti-vaxxers they're gonna be like okay we we're gonna expect some of this shit too right yeah so the issue with with with, with everyday people is um we've always had a, a tremendous demand right so i knew that i could um promote a, a vaccination only party and still sell out mm -hmm. that thing i was gonna sell out in three hours i did it you know, but the problem with some of my other homies who are doing like smaller scale parties in, in in New York is they can't quite afford to gamble with that. If, you know, a large part of their constituents uh, are opposed to vaccination or just not even opposed to vaccination. Some people are just opposed to having to show their vaccination status. You know, mm -hmm. um, they may their party may not be able to suffer that backlash. So yesterday, after what happened on our social media, three or four homies that I know hit me up. And, and I told them, listen, just sit it out. Once New York gets to 70% uh, fully immunized or partially immunized, then you're free to open your doors to everyone. So sit it out. And then the next day, Cuomo announced the 70%. This is not perfect, man. Everybody's learning. We're learning as we go, man. Every day is like something new that we learn. Yeah. You know? I, I, it's just I feel like the the public is unfair. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't think they I don't think they realize the state that we're in right now. So they want everything to be like either completely left or completely right. You know what I'm saying? And we're still kind of in the middle. And no one wants to like. No one understands the logistics between behind like throwing an event like this and what goes into it. And uh, they really don't. And 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 then the dilemma is. Do you not do anything until everyone can attend? Or do you do something that the vast majority of people can attend and it allows you to, you know, feed yourself 
and your family, you know, because we've been unemployed for 16 months. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's, it's a very interesting dilemma. And you would think that maybe somebody who's opposed to vaccination but who has a plethora of options for shit to do in New York. There's so much going on in the park, right? Prospect Park, Fort Greene Park, Central Park, just that and the third. You, you would think that they might be able to like compartmentalize and be like, you know what? Everyday people is trying to eat. This party's going to be sold out anyway. I can do some other shit. Maybe in two to three weeks, we can all like gather again, you know, without any exclusions. You would think they'd be able to compartmentalize that. But nah, because, you know, every mug out there is the fucking lead character of the story of their lives. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they get outraged and then they go to their, you know, the, they get on their soapbox, which is Instagram, and they let you know about their outrage. Mm-hmm. But really, you know, a lot of them are yelling in the dark. Some of them are making good points, but a lot of them is just like yelling in the dark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are back, man. I wish I could be there in New York, but I'm going to be there hopefully around 4th of July-ish time. So I, I think uh, I might be in, hopefully you'll have one around in around that time, end of June. We have one in New York on July 5th, and I'm still trying to figure out L.A. I can't wait for L.A., bro. Yeah. LA. I'm coming yeah. hot, bro. I'm July driving. Out here. <laughs> By the way, man, the level of vaccination, um, because, uh, you know, everyday people is a black party. Let's call it what it is, right? Yeah. The, the level of vaccination amongst black people is, is lower than the national average or the state average. But just talking to people from the entertainment industry, nightlife industry, yo, know, people in L.A. are so unvaccinated. It is <laughs> wild. Oh, wild. That's crazy. I threw a couple of parties in L.A. that were uh, private parties that were vaccination only. Uh-huh. Wait, wait, wait. And, what, 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 what private party was this? Was, uh, <laughs> was Lupi, Lupita was hanging out. I just got to say that. It was a private party um, at a you know, friend's house. <laughs> I was, okay. what, what kind of friend? What does your friend do? <laughs> uh, she's in film. She's in uh, music. Oh, okay. Um, and she has a lot of, you know, artist friends, right? Right. But because she's about to shoot a film, um, they had really strong COVID protocols around the party, like vaccination mandates. Uh, We had nurses outside the party, rapid testing on arrival. You would have to wait outside for five to 10 minutes before you walked in. It was, by and large, the safest I've ever felt in a in a public setting, in a private public setting, you know, with other people. This sounds like a very you know, very ritzy uh, private party if they have nurses and stuff uh, outside and, and all of that. And they're hiring you and stuff. No no expenses were spared to <laughs> ensure people's safety. Why don't okay. we say that? <laughs> Why don't we say that? Uh, it, was, but it sounds like there was some good, there was some money, money in the building that you were doing the private party for. Yes? I'm going to say talent. There was a lot of talent. A lot of talent. Okay. Of talent. It sounds like there was, a, there was an orchestra in the hallway. There may have oh. been a 12-piece string ensemble. Oh, wow. <laughs> facts. Um, uh, but wait, uh, I, I lost my train of thought. The vaccinations, about, yeah. The vaccination LA. No, but I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah, so LA. So, uh, you know, a party like that is very elite. Yeah. You know? And you love that. So, you love that. You love that it's elite like that. You kind of... You yeah, because for me, elite doesn't mean, like, rich or celebrity. Mm-hmm. It means... Who's your top people who bring the best vibes and who know how to behave? Well said. Well said. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. Because like, if you walk in a room and you see half a dozen of your favorite artists, if you ask them for a photo, if you try to selfie them on your IG live, you're going to kill the vibe, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to make those people uncomfortable. That's, you become the virus. So, so D, <laughs> so D Miles could never go to one of these events. Pretty much. No, right? bro. <laughs> I know how to be. To me that day, I was like, come on, man. <laughs> I know how to behave. Cook, come on, man. So, so I immediately I thought to myself, I got like you know about because it's small. I got like forty to fifty people that I know very well. You know, New Yorkers who move to LA or like just cool people I know from LA yeah. who attend everyday people regularly. You know, the people who who know the vibes, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I hit up like about 40 or 50 people and 
you know, only about 20 of them were vaccinated, you know? The, the, the rest was like, nah, I'm, I'm not vaccinated. I was like, that's crazy. Because in New York, even like a lot of the anti-vaxxers are vaccinated in New York because they just, you just got to. We, we live on top of each other, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But LA is so different with all the wide open spaces, you know, everybody, no mass transit. Um, and a lot of people in the entertainment industry, whether they're actors or musicians or dancers, in their line of work, there's all this COVID compliance officers and COVID protocols. They get tested three to four times a week on the job. You know what I mean? So you kind of, in the entertainment industry in LA, you kind of don't need a vaccine. But New York, we're all service industry, you know? We're nightlife, we're restaurants. So in, in, in New York, we're hospitality, restaurant industry, theater, Broadway, whatever your vaccination feelings are, wherever you stand on that divide, as far as your livelihood is concerned, a lot of times you can't get back to work unless you're vaccinated. That's why so many people that I would hit up in New York would be vaccinated. In LA, I was a little shocked, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, Mo, like the two, uh, the two um, you know, my fellow hosts, my fellow co-hosts, you know, on this podcast, the two that were from L.A. were the most stubborn to get vaccinated. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I had to twist their arms, you know what I'm saying? And it was, uh, I, I get totally what you mean. That the two There's a trauma. <laughs> There's a trauma associated with being from New York when it comes to COVID. Yeah. You know, we were the epicenter of, of the pandemic. Like, people literally seen a wet market in, in Wuhan. Then they seen Italy get shut down. And then they seen refrigerated trucks in New York. That sure Those are the weird. images from the first month and a half of this pandemic, right? Yeah. So we're, we have serious trauma when it comes to COVID. So yeah, for right or wrong, when that vaccine came out, people lined up, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying, for it. But in LA, y'all mugs is just watching it on the news. <laughs> it seemed kind of distant, unless it personally impacted your family it just looked like this thing that's kind of abstract and you just see numbers on a screen yeah. on CNN going up every day. So that's why I was in LA in, in, in October and I'm in LA now. Aside from like being able to go to highlight room and shit like that, it kind of feels the same, right? But New York, the way it feels now versus October, September is totally different, you know? But it's like a... LA is slowly popping though. I seen it wilding out. Like LA is wilding out right now. Like in, in October, there was there was open spaces like bars and shit. But I feel like recently, like the Highlight Room and some of these other places like Bootsy Below's and shit, it's it's different. Yeah, it's way different. I, it's, but it's, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying, Mo. It's turned yeah, though. The, the, like LA's LA's ready. LA's open. Oh, like, they're you know more. Let me tell you, on the low. Yeah. On the low. L.A. was virtually as reckless as Atlanta and Miami. Yeah. The only difference <laughs> is that Atlanta and Miami was legal because everything was open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and those are like, you know, southern Republican states with like these crazy governors um, who would just like politicize mask wearing and all that shit. So that's why those places were going off the entire pandemic. L.A. was kind of doing it on the low because underground how slack style. they were with enforcement mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah yeah also like policing quality of life shit in la is, is so hard because it's it's so it's, it's so sprawling you know but uh, you know what like i i just came from san diego you know shout to dj scooter his restaurant in pacific beach firehouse they're still open you know i was talking to him about you know the past year and what they've had to do to like survive and just seeing all the all of these like all these mom and pop restaurants still surviving and still open, I thought it was just like really good. And some of them were like telling me, you know, we had to operate like this under the table a little bit. You know, we had to do what we had to do to survive. We had to kind of, you know, like open, you know, we had to do this, we had to do that. And I was just like, yo, I get it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like no one's really trying to like really do anything to harm anyone, but it's like, yo, like Cali wasn't really doing anything for their people or or these businesses at that yeah. time. They were Listen, And I'm not I'm really not mad because you're talking about, you know, personal responsibility and yeah. assuming the risk. 
if you're going to a restaurant, I'm I'm very willing to assume that risk, and right. I'm not I'm not looking down at anyone that's doing that. You know? Yeah. If you're in a crowded indoor nightclub, blowing smoke, uh, who who could smoke in everybody's <laughs> face, and no one is vaccinated in that space, you just gotta you gotta think to yourself, this is not this is not the healthiest environment mm-hmm. right now, right? And when I say right now, I mean in the heart of the pandemic, when we was watching that shit go down in Atlanta. And, and Miami. It's now a year later. I kind of don't care what anyone does. You know what I mean? It's just personal responsibility and you assume the risk. And if you feel safe in a vaccine only environment, that's where you should hang out. Good one, Mo. I'm, yo, thank you for coming on the podcast, fam, as always. I'm, My pleasure. I can't wait to be at the next Everyday People. And uh, I'm, it's really, it really makes me happy to see you guys back. And uh, I can't, you know, fam, L.A., New York, wherever the fuck you're going to be, I'm going to try to be there. All right? Let's do it. Hey, yo, real quick, real quick, I want to plug DJ Audio One's Twitch page. Um, Twitch.tv slash DJ Audio One. All the homies have been holding his page down while he's been in recovery. All the DJs rally together. They've been keeping his page going, DJing on his Twitch, uh, making sure that he's getting some money in because homeboy's been in recovery. And we want him to focus on his health, but not also worry about paying them hospital bills and paying for all his expenses while he's, uh, you know, recovering. Um, but the best way to really donate is to uh, send him money directly. And I want to put his PayPal up. Um, so make sure you can, you know, send him $2, $5, $10, $20, whatever you can, man. Anything helps. Um, he's one of us. He's one of he's a DJ. And this shit could happen to any one of us, and and um, we we gotta we gotta look out for each other. Yo, Mo, thank you, man, again, and I hopefully see you soon, bro. All right, my all my guys, I'll talk to y'all. All right, peace, peace, peace. peace. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace. <laughs>